it is just wonderful to be with you. This has been a highlight for me every year. And and uh, last year I was so torn about going to China with our youth from the Northeastern Jurisdiction. I, I, I really wrestled with it and then decided that I would, I would do it. But that means that some of you, was anybody here last year for God's Call? Okay. Well, good. good. Well, now I'm with you and I'm, I'm so delighted to be because this is crucial. <coughs> As uh, Carol said, that I really care about young people. But Something I looked at at some point. But 
lawyers are no longer generalists. They're tax lawyers, or they're property lawyers, or they are uh, corporate lawyers, or uh, physicians. It's, it's very hard to find a general practitioner these days. They're all specialists. But we're generalists. From the cradle to the grave, we're there for the people. One of the great things for me in being a pastor is that you never know what your day will hold. It could be anything from helping someone who's been a flood victim to counseling with someone who's making a, a, a decision in their professional life to gathering with a group of people to chart a new course for the church to holding the hand of someone who's dying to being present uh, shortly after the birth of a child all of that is a part of your day work. so but the what the discipline says is that you must first have a personal faith in Christ and be committed to Christ. That's central. That has to be the beginning. A live, vibrant faith in Christ. Um, you need to, in your own life, nurture pastor the patterns of holiness. That is, be a praying person. Read the Bible. Be one who uh, practices spiritual disciplines in order to keep your faith alive. Uh, and then acknowledge a call that God has actually called you. And be willing to follow that, whatever that takes. And if you choose to be an uh, ordained elder, that means you go where you're sent. And that isn't always something that you think you want to do. When I when I received my second appointment, I got a call from the superintendent and they said, you're going to a town in Connecticut called Naugatuck. And I said, Naugatuck? <laughs> and I, I <laughs> told my husband, he, he did exactly the same thing, Naugatuck. <laughs> and then he told the kids, and they said the same thing, Naugatuck. <laughs> but I had eight glorious, wonderful years in Naugatuck. <laughs> the last place I would have ever imagined being assigned. So being willing to, to give yourself go for your sin. Um, to be persuasive and con- <coughs> communicating with them. To do it with energy and enthusiasm and passion. And to make a commitment to lead the whole church in serving others. That was the power of that video lesson. We know we live in a broken world, that sometimes we feel helpless. And often alone we are. But when we, as the church, decide to take on some aspect of that brokenness, there is such power. And people are looking for that in, in their lives. You're looking for that, aren't you? to do something that really makes a difference. So you need to give evidence that there that God's grace is, is acting in your life. What we say when you're thinking that perhaps you're called to be obeyed, do you have the gifts? And is there evidence of God's grace in your life? You need to be someone that people trust. Do you find that in your life? That you're someone that your friends can come to and you're trustworthy? Do you find that in your relationships? That's a, something you need to think about. Is it? Are you someone in whom people place trust and confidence? And then you have to be accountable to the United Methodist Church and agree to do that. We don't need any uh, free-floating folks out there. One of the things we we say in the United Methodist Church is that we are a connectional church. It's one of those phrases that we use. And it means that we have mutual accountability. We make the promise that we will 
help you find the best place for you to serve. And you make the promise that you will go over sent. When I was elected a bishop, I got a call at about 6.30 the next morning. And they said, you will be coming to Pennsylvania. And I said, yes. I had no choice. You go for your sin. Um, one of the things I want to really emphasize is the importance of being. You are a leader as a pastor of the church and as a deacon. It isn't enough to love God. It isn't enough to prepare yourself with sin. That you must be a leader. I want to ask you now, are you a leader in your setting? Whether that be your high school, sports, your church, um, college. Are you a leader? Are you in leadership positions? If you aren't, one of the most important things you need to begin to work on is making sure you, you find your find ways <coughs> to build your leadership skills. We don't need sweet, nice people as pastors. We need people who understand that they are empowered by God to be a leader. When uh, I realized I was called, I thought, you know, I can't do this. I, I just, I can't do this. I was a leader. I was, uh, have been a leader most of my life. But I thought, I can't, I can't be a pastor. I'm not worthy of being a pastor. I was very much like Moses. I just can't do it. But I came to understand that it was true I can't do it. Except that God called me. And because God has called me, I can know that God will give me what I need to be the leader that God has called me. And only with that understanding can I do. So if God calls you, God will prepare you for every circumstance that you encounter. That's why that whole piece of discernment is so important. That's why it's so important to, to keep questioning, is this what God wants me to do? And some of you have said, do it only if you can do anything else. Um, I'm not sure that's the right question or the right statement. I think, I think it's important to be able to do a lot of things. But to know that God has called you to do this, One of the things that I'm absolutely convinced of is that Jesus Christ is truly the hope of the world. And the church is God's agent for spreading that hope. We sometimes lose our way in the church, and you've been, perhaps been part of churches that tend to have lost their way. They turned inward and got focused on simply surviving. But that's no longer where we're going to be as the church. We're at a very exciting time in the life of the church, I believe, because we're reevaluating everything, <coughs> all of who we are, and recommitting ourselves to be who we need to be in order to truly make disciples of Jesus Christ, in order to truly be partners with God and transform the world. And so your church and others are finding ways to be out in the community where God is calling us to be. So I think that as a pastor, this is what you need to be willing to do. Stay in love with God. Work on your relationship with God at all times. Mm -hmm. Do that in your own private time prayer, journaling, finding spiritual direction, 
meeting with others who care about you and you care about and learning together. <coughs> One of the most exciting times in my own life was seminary. It was just a wonderful, wonderful time. So wonderful. <coughs> when it came, when it was time for me to graduate, I just didn't see how I could possibly leave. Mm-hmm. And I went to see my mentor and advisor, Sister Margaret Farley, who taught at my seminary. Uh, t- with tears running down my face, I said, I just can't believe. And she said, well, you could stay and take a- another master's degree. And in that instant, I left. <laughs> you get over it, it's sad, and you move on. But it was in seminary that I, that I found lifelong friends and uh, grew so much. And so it's, it's, this isn't a lonely position. Mm-hmm. If you reach out and gather around you the people who will help you on the journey. It's crucial that you really care about people. Maybe the most important thing you do as a pastor is simply love the people. Simply love the people to whom God has appointed you and assigned you. Uh, They may not be lovable at all times. But there is not a person that I've not found, if you scratch beneath the surface of what often is very negative behavior, that I haven't found a a hurting person who's yearning to be whole Mm. and who needs to know how passionately they're loved by God. Uh, we're called to multiply the faith. We're called to make disciples. If we're not making disciples, we're not being faithful. So we're called to, to enlist others and roll them in a division of faith. And to be passionate about mission. That's who we are as the church. Mm-hmm. We're not there to sustain the people in the four walls. We're there to reach out and make a difference in this world. So I bless you on this journey you're on. And as we've said before, you're called. Every single one of you is called. God has laid a claim on your life. God is calling you by name and saying, you are my God. I'm calling you. Your task is to find out how. Let us pray. Oh God, I give you thanks and praise for these young people who present themselves for this time. For this time. I give you thanks for the extraordinary ways you're already working in each one. Each one a precious child called by you, empowered by you, claimed by you. I pray that you will put those people and experiences in their lives that will help them find their way to name their calling and to fulfill it. <coughs> Hold them and love them tenderly, O God, and may those that they encounter love as well, and may they learn to love us.